edition of RCE. Uh, this is Brock Palin. You can follow me at Twitter at uh, B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N. Uh, I also have with me Jeff Squires. You can find a link to Jeff's blog off of the RCE website at rce-cast.com. Also, there's a nomination form. We love hearing what you guys would like to hear about. Uh, Jeff and I see cover a large basis stuff, but Jeff probably has his own input too about things that are going on in the HPC world. Yeah, it's always nice. I, I actually got uh, twonked by a, a blog reader uh, for a post I made earlier. But I got some a bunch of statistics wrong, and uh, he he quite rightfully called me on it. And it took several days of back and forth of email and stuff like that for him to educate me in what the correct way was. And so I had to print a redaction. It was very embarrassing, but at the same time, it's very encouraging to know that people actually are reading it. So that was nice. Always good to keep you honest. Mm -hmm. uh, who do we have with us today? Well, today we're talking about uh, an interesting topic in the HPC world that a lot of people like to talk about, parallel file systems. And I think we're going to be talking about PVFS and PVFS2. Okay. Our guest is Walt Lingen. Uh, I think I got that right. Well, how about you introduce yourself and correct me if I pronounce your name wrong and tell us about PVFS and what your affiliation is. Okay, um, my name is Walt Ligon, and uh, I'm an associate professor at <clears throat> Clemson University and uh, one of the original developers of uh, PVFS, the Parallel Virtual File System. Okay, so PVFS has been around for quite some time. It was actually the first parallel file system I ever screwed with. Um, can you tell us a little bit of detail about what a parallel file system is and how PVFS accomplishes it? Sure. Um, a parallel file system is really just a, a file system that's designed to support parallel computing, and that has two uh, aspects to it. One aspect is that what we try to do is distribute the data across many nodes in a parallel computer so that we can use all of the uh, I.O. subsystems of those nodes to get you know faster I.O. So that's one of the big deals is make the I.O. go a lot faster. Uh, then the other aspect is that we have to provide that data to the many tasks of a parallel program. So we support having many tasks uh, accessing the same file concurrently um, and doing their data retrieval at a very high rate. Um, so that's basically what a parallel file system is. Uh, PVFS we, was originally designed in 1993 to be uh, the file system for um, something called PVM, which was an early package for doing parallel computing. That's where the name came from. It was a play on PVM. Um, but then uh, after the initial version, uh, my graduate student, Robert Ross, um, rewrote the system, and that's what became known as PVFS-1. Um, then about year 2000, we uh, completely rewrote the system into what is now called PVFS-2, and that's what uh, most people or what everybody who's using PVFS uses today. So what's kind of the big difference between PVFS-1 and 2? You say you rewrote it. I, I assume there was some re-architecting in there. Or were there big uh, functional changes or, or what? Absolutely, it, it, it was a completely complete rearchitecting. When we wrote PVFS one, we were really trying to sort of understand what goes into making a file system work, and a lot of uh, what we dealt with was how to really build a server that could concurrently handle a large number of requests simultaneously and and do an efficient job of that. Uh, the, our old server. Uh, was based on some ideas that we had gotten out of the literature, you know, back then that were based on the idea that the the, the network generally was a lot faster than the than the processors ru running in in the and the disks, and we uh, found that when the ratio of the speed of those various things changed. The, uh, the, the way the file system reacted changed. And so we, we completely redesigned it so we had a lot more flexibility. Uh, also, in terms of functionality, um, the original PVFS allowed any given uh, read or write to access data that is distributed throughout the file in what we call a strided fashion. That That's just a complicated word that says, uh, I want to read, say, 100 bytes here and then skip 200 bytes and read another 100 bytes and skip another 200 and keep doing that 
pattern for however many iterations. We, we could do that with one small request in PVFS1. Okay, so also in that in that rearchitecture, this is you said it was around 2000 or so. This is kind of when uh, MPI was quite popular and PVM was kind of on the way out the door. D did you guys have any aspirations towards MPIO as part of the new architecture, or or how did that work? Absolutely, uh, PVFS two was designed specifically to be a, a, an MPIO file system. Uh, we. Um, designed it so that the MPI data type became the model for our request type. So when you actually send a request for data to MPI, you could directly send an MPI data type to it. And that's, as far as I know, is the only file system that's ever actually done that. Um, the other thing that happened was that Rob Ross went to Argonne about that time and where MPI, one of the big MPI centers, and so he got involved directly in MPI. So we kind of have been working very closely with them ever since. So PVFS is designed for MPI-IO. Is it designed to handle any other type of I.O., um, or is it really only meant to take I.O. from some sort of parallel library? Uh, no, actually, you can use PVFS with, with any kind of uh, program. We, the uh, PVFS actually has a... Its interface is really not designed for normal programmers. It's something we call a system-level interface, and you can then plug it under a whole host of different um, interfaces. This was another part of the re-architecting. So MPI is, that was definitely one of the key ones, but the POSIX interface works quite well with it, and uh, we even are currently working on some new interfaces. There's a kernel module to be able to access it. You said POSIX interface, so there is a kernel module where you can just mount PVFS like any other, like NFS or Luster or one of these other POSIX file systems? Exactly. Uh, we we have this, um, the kernel module, that allows you to mount it just like any other file system. Uh, there's also a Fuse module that you can mount it under Fuse, and that gives you some more platforms that we didn't used to have. And then we have libraries that can give you uh, direct access. You generally get the best performance out of the, dir the uh, direct libraries, and so that's what you know the serious applications use. But for everyday working with your files, you know, people don't want to have to write a special program, and so that's where the kernel modules are really useful. Has anyone written uh, like a database interface where you can make PVFS look like your storage engine for a database? Um, there are some people who have played with that. I don't, I'm not really familiar uh, with the details of it. Uh, we actually have a database under the covers in PVFS, and one of our, our research projects involves uh, exposing that to the user. That's part of one of the new, new interfaces I was mentioning, um, so that you can actually do queries in your file system to locate data other than just navigating through a directory tree like you do normally. So going off in a slightly different direction here, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure here. So uh, you mentioned that parallel file systems are, you're, you're trying to capitalize on the IO subsystem. But what does a typical PVFS setup look like? What's, what's the constraints on the system administrator? What, what do they have to set up and things like that? Um, to set up PVFS, you, you designate certain nodes that are going to be servers. Uh, if you have a small cluster, that can be just any node in your system, but usually those are special nodes that people are set aside. They have uh, uh, big disks on them and this sort of thing. Um, you install the, the server process, and you have to install a startup script like you would for most uh, service applications. Um, there's a config file where you primarily list, you know, which systems you're go are going to be your servers and so forth. Um, then there's a library that you're going to install on any node that wants to be a client, which is usually all of your, your other nodes. Uh, if you want to use the kernel module, then you'll install the kernel module on those client nodes as well. And there's a, actually a process that works with the kernel module called the client core, and you have to install that. Um, but most of that, again, we've got you know install scripts that do that pretty much, and there's a there's a nice little write up that makes it not not too difficult to do. So, did you say that the server sides are usually dedicated machines, or are they usually multitasked with you know, other things like an interactive login machine or things like that, or is this kind of just everybody 
does something different. Well, di most of the large installations, like what we have here at Clemson, we have a set of machines set aside to be I.O. servers, and that's all they do is act as I.O. IO servers. But if somebody wanted to install this on a smaller cluster, um, particularly in the early days when you had people with you know, 32 node clusters that they were experimenting with, you can install it right on a node that you're using as a, a compute node. In fact, when we test out um, some of our new distributions, we go out on our compute nodes, install it, and run it right out of our home file system on a group of nodes and test it that way. So is this uh, user space stuff? Uh, you mentioned there's, there's a kernel space side to it, but uh, you know the server processes themselves, do those need to run with any special privileges? Or are they root privileges or just a dedicated user, or how does that go? Um, you can run the uh, server with a dedicated user. You can run it as root if you want to, um, but there's no the, there's no kernel modules or kernel patches or anything designed. You can run uh, everything in the file system except installing the kernel module um, as a normal user if you want to. So 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 that's a perfectly valid way to run it. Again, in order to install a kernel module, you, you have to be you know root to do that. Um, but that's just for setup. So has anybody ever created, um, say, a job where their job just kind of creates a PVFS infrastructure for their job? Like they actually take all the compute nodes, uses some space and temp or some other storage and kind of spins up a file system just for their given job? Uh, yeah, they have. And in fact, we even have a, uh, a special tool that comes in the distribution that does that. We have a tool that's designed to basically, just like doing a make, build a complete file system for you. We use that primarily for testing so that if we want to run multiple tests, we can send that off, create a little file system on a group of nodes, run a job, and we're done. But there are definitely people who have experimented with using PVFS uh, in that mode, particularly for things like checkpointing. If you wanted to set up checkpoints um, that were on the nodes in question. Um, that way you don't necessarily have to send your checkpoint data all the way across the uh, network to an I.O. node over there. And plus, the bigger your job is, the more nodes you've got, the more I.O. nodes you've got. And so you can run it faster and faster without worrying about how many of them are being used by somebody else. So yeah, you can definitely do that. So when I create a PVFS file system, do I have to have a raw block device for it, or do I just kind of does PVFS rely on a an underlying file system for actually getting the bits onto disk? Uh, that's why we call it a virtual file system because PVFS does not actually manage the blocks in a, on a block device the way a normal file system does. We store our data on top of whatever file system is provided by uh, the underlying system. Um, we store it. Some the, the actual data is stored in usual uh, in normal files. Our metadata is actually stored using the Berkeley DB, which sit, can sit on top of normal files. Um, again, we have people who have been experimenting with uh, more exotic ways of laying out the data for performance reasons. But so far, everything we've done sits on top of the user of a user file system. So an obvious question out of that is, do you sacrifice any performance out of that? Because all the, the quote-unquote uh, non-virtual file systems, you know, write directly to disk. And at least from my layman's mind, I would think that that would be a, at least a little bit of a performance boost. Or is it kind of negligible? How does... Well, actually, uh, quite a number of the other uh, systems that are used like PVFS do the same thing that we do. Um, but... Yes, there could be some loss in performance in the sense that uh, you don't have control over how you, you choose to order your disks. But most of the time, a local file system, the metadata, that block management stuff, is held in memory anyway. So the writes go pretty much directly to disk. It's just a matter of how the, 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 disks are, the blocks are managed, so how you choose to select a free block and get rid of free blocks and that sort of thing. 
most of the time the existing file systems are pretty good at doing that. But that's part of why we've got some experiments going. We, we've been asking ourselves the same question. When we start getting, particularly when you start getting to new devices like an SSD or some of the newer RAID devices that are out there, um, can we do a better job if we know exactly what we're doing with the disk? And I've got, you know, actually right now some students who are, uh, who are studying that question. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, let me ask you, this is related, but probably only by the, the topical words. So we've been talking about throwing blocks around and things like that, but there's also, actually, maybe you can explain what's the difference between a, a block parallel file system and an object-based parallel file system, and then which one is PVFS2? Right. Um, a block parallel file system is are this, those that um, where a block device on the server is shared with the client directly. So what happens is the client, it's almost like the client doesn't even realize that it's writing across the network. It, all it knows is it has multiple block devices here, multiple disks it looks like that it writes to. So the, the, the actual disk blocks are transferred back and forth uh, to the servers. Um, and there are some file systems that have had enjoyed you know really good performance doing that, particularly when they had um, uh, hardware that supported it. So, uh, so one of them in particular in, that I, I can think of had custom hardware in the network for doing block transfers, and it was a really well done file system on their hardware. Uh, an object-based system is a little bit different, and this is what PVFS is: is an object-based system. The servers just manage objects, and the objects can be any number of things. They can be data, they can be metadata, they can be directory entries, they can be directory metadata, and so forth. And then this, these uh, objects are spread around to the different servers, and those objects then are addressed locally within the object. And, and what I mean by that is that the object consists of so many bytes on that server, and I can reference that I want a certain range of bytes relative to that object on the server as opposed to just saying I want block number 42 off of that disk. So it's, it's a layer of abstraction, okay, and that's exactly what PVFS does. It has this layer of abstraction on top um, to make it a little bit simpler so that the client never has to worry about the actual devices at the, um, at the servers. It just thinks of them as a group of logical bytes that it can read and write. So when you have a parallel file system, generally you can specify how many storage servers you want to stripe a file across. Is this configurable inside PVFS, and how is that controlled? Uh, yes, it, it definitely is. Um, you, there is a, a configuration file for the entire file system, and you can set on the configuration file the default number of um, servers you want to distribute files across. Um, since most systems have been relatively small, they usually by default set that default to all of them. But when you start getting into a large system, you, yes, you can, you can set that to, to a lesser number. Um, plus, you can override that number when you create a file um, using some form of hints. Now, the, the issue with hints is that it has to do with the interface you're using. If you're using the, the standard kernel interface, it doesn't really have a hint mechanism, um, so it's hard to do that. If you're using MPI, MPI has hints for setting the number of servers you want to distribute across. Uh, and some of the, in, the uh, interfaces we've been developing look like POSIX but give you some of this extra capability so that you can do that. So how do um, striping across multiple servers work into the object model that you use? Do you kind of write an object at a time, or is it more complicated than that? Um, when you create a file, so if I can create a file and I can choose to, uh, I want to distribute the file across eight servers, so I create eight data objects that are going to hold the data for my file. And at, at the time I create it, I also specify something called a distribution. Um, most file systems have a fixed distribution. PVFS actually allows you to have different distributions on each file, but most people use the standard one, which is just simple striping. 
Uh, once you've done that, then as I write data to my file, the, that distribution will take the file and will distribute it across those eight objects. So if I write um, 100 megabytes, it'll write the first so many bytes to one object and then so many to the next and so on and so forth. When it gets to the end, it'll wrap around and keep going. Uh, that amount of data that you choose to write to each object is called the strip size. Um, and that's also a configurable item. It, it also has a default built in so that if you don't want to worry about it, you can just use the default. All right, going off in a slightly different direction here, how does uh, PBFS handle errors? Is it uh, particularly like a, a node failure or a disk failure or something like that? Is there any concept of resiliency built in, maybe uh, built in RAID-like control? Do you replicate objects or how do, how do you do these kinds of things? Well, originally when we designed PVFS, our concern was how to make it go as fast as we could. And we decided not to address that issue because it's a complicated one. And we figured that other people would address that issue. And at some point in the future, you know, that th those features would all get incorporated into some future system. At the time, we really didn't expect PVFS to, to last as long as it did. Um, now, in the last couple of years, we have, in fact, been developing replication. We do have available... Um, modules that will replicate data um, across different servers and we're right now working on modules that replicate metadata across the objects um, and there's there's a lot of different ways you can do that and that's one of the pro that's sort of one of the you know issues uh, is is choosing the best way to do it and and what happens to your performance when you do it because that can it can cost you some performance um, and we we like to be able to you know let ch users decide if they need that or not. Uh, up till now, uh, most of the the production installations that we're aware of have used um, a hardware level uh, redundancy to to protect their data. So in other words, what they'll do is they'll put a RAID on each server so that if a disk fails, it's backed up through the RAID, uh, and then they use uh, redundant connections to those RAIDs between the servers so that if a server dies, another server can start up another process and, and get access to that, that box. And so that gives you a pretty good amount of protection for that. Um, still, though, everybody tells us they want to have it in software, they want to have both capabilities available to them and there's people who don't have the money for the more complex hardware solution that want uh, this so we've we've been working on it and that's that's one of our newer things okay and when you say you want the resiliency in the software what uh, what do you mean by that do you mean exposing that out through the user level libraries to the application itself or still preserving that, that transparency of, of something like a hardware solution but uh, through software meaning that you know, I just say, give me my object, and if somebody handles some faults in the background for me, and I, you know, at the end of the day, I, I still just get my object. No, I'm, I mean just the, trans the transparent of you, where you ask for the data, you get, you, you get your data. Um, what I mean by in the software is, is the difference between us doing replication in software and actually sending some data to one node and a copy to another node versus doing it hardware where you actually have a RAID controller so that when I write to this disk, it just automatically creates duplicates and does that for you. Gotcha. So what are some of the main uh, supporting interfaces for PVFS? We mentioned the kernel module, but for doing real stuff, you have to write to PVFS. Uh, Romeo for providing MPIO, I know it has a driver for PVFS and is in, of course, OpenMPI, MPICH, and a couple of the other MPI libraries. What are some of the other things that have written to PVFS to get the maximum performance from PVFS? Um, we have a, um, a set of interfaces that we're developing that are written specifically for PVFS, and they provide actually. It, there's a there's a core for writing to PVFS efficiently, and then on top of that is an MPI implementation MPI IO implementation that can be used with uh, OpenMPI or or MPI or whatever MPI you like, or actually 
could be used with a non-MPI program if you really wanted. Um, and then we also have a POSIX-like interface there that um, looks like a POSIX interface, but we've added extra features so that you can get at some of the things that you want to be able to do with PVFS, like control the number of uh, objects you distribute across, control the striping size, um, set some of the different modes that are that are capable, and so on. So, so we've been. This is actually something that we're we have in development right now, um, so that you can get at that without going through MPI if you want to. Uh, beyond that, there there are some other projects. There's a, the Audios project at uh, Oak Ridge. And we've been talking with them um, about the possibility of putting that on top of PVFS, but that's still a fairly early, um, uh, still a fairly early idea. And we've got some other things up our sleeve that are probably so new that <laughs> may not be worth an, worth announcing at this point. But the, these <laughs> other interfaces are are definitely uh, are pretty much done. They're just in the uh, the testing phase right now. So as an MPI guy, I, I'm actually well familiar with Romeo and, and familiar with those kinds of interfaces and so on. But I, I, you know, working in Cisco and working in the server division and stuff, I, I get exposed to a lot of non-HPC uh, kinds of uses of technology that, that trickles out, right? So it, it's it's slowly making its world way into the data center and, and to the rest of the world and so on. Could you give us, and, and with full disclaimers here, that this is kind of just asking you to answer something off the cuff and predict the future, but where do you see the use of, of, of parallel file systems going, particularly in a you know Google sized data center world and and whatnot that you know just beyond the HPC where parallel file systems have kind of grown up, you know how do you see these applying to the rest of the world? Well, really, that's one of the things that we've been looking at here at Clemson, and uh, one of the things that I really haven't mentioned, but maybe now is a, a good time to, is that uh, we've kind of cre been creating a forked PVFS. Uh, it's not really a forked PVFS; it's a separate distribution. It is a branch in the in the repository, so it's all still one source code, all the development is still shared between everybody, but there's the group at Argonne has really been focusing very heavily on blue gene and the large scale HPC systems. And at Clemson we're starting to look at this exactly what you mentioned, sort of this what who else might be interested in this. We have people in the uh, the genetics uh world down here who um do an awful lot of uh processing of data and they don't understand MPI. They don't. It, it doesn't look like a an HPC type of operation. We have people in the business world. We've had a a, a very large uh, user out in uh, Arkansas who was doing data mining for uh, large corporations. I, I don't know that I can <laughs> say their name, but uh, they've actually been actively involved in uh, PVFS development for more than five years now. Um, so. Yes, I think there's there's a lot of th this stuff in in the the broader world that's starting to come along, and this is part of why uh, there's now kind of a separate group that's starting to look at problems like the redundancy problem that you mentioned. That's something we finally said, look, we've got to do something about that if we're going to move into this area. Um, we're looking at the security side of things. Uh, we're PVFS has never had particularly strong security, so we're working on that. Uh, we're Building new interfaces, the whole drive to do that is so that the file system can be made available to uh, some of these, what you might, I guess you'd call non-traditional, you know, groups for at least for, for HPC. So how about we compare PVFS to some other products out there? Um, so what would be your opinion on some of the other parallel file systems out there? You can name names if you want. But uh, what's a parallel file system you admire? Uh, systems I admire, I definitely admire uh, the guys at IBM who've done GPFS. Um, that's that; those guys have have definitely, and they're a different side of the world. Um, at least one of the members on the GPS team, in fact, was a guy that when I was in, uh, working on my PhD, we were buddies back then, had the same advisor, and we sat and argued. Uh, Design points at conferences before just just out of spirit. So, so that's a that's they definitely have some good stuff, and we've looked at some of their design issues and 
taking some of that stuff into consideration. Um, Panassas is a you know, has really done an excellent job of getting high performance I/O uh, into the world. Um, Garth Gibson is again a, a, f- a friend of ours. He's he's been involved with stuff with PVFS. Uh, it, it, he actually looks at PVFS as sort of his not non-commercial side of things. When he when he gets his students at CMU to work on a project, um, they tend to use PVFS because they they can't open up the the, the source to Panassas to do that. So I think those guys you know are definitely doing some good things. Um, the Google file system is really interesting because it was it's a unique opportunity to say we have a really really specific set of things that we want to do and we can build a piece of software that just does that. It wouldn't work for a whole lot of other people um, because they really narrowed themselves down to their application, but they did some interesting things uh, um, with it. Um, And then, of course, the other one, the one that I guess comes up the most often is is Luster. and Luster and PVFS have been, I guess, have been rivals for a long time. Uh, for a number of years, I think uh, people on our side of the of the house, people on their side of the house, have sort of traded barbed uh, barbed comments about each other. But that's kind <laughs> of not something that I've wanted to do. I've tried to stay out of that. I, I think those guys do some good work. I think clearly they've taken some ideas from us, which is what we intended in developing um, our project. We're, we've always been a research group, and we look at what they do and, and, and kind of follow some of that. And, um, you know, so there you go. There you go. Excellent. Excellent way to dance around that uh, difficult question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. But it, it actually leads into another question. So who else is in involved in the, the PVFS uh, development. So, you, you know, you're at Clemson. Are there other organizations as well? Oh, my word, yes. Uh, let's see. Well, so the main centers are, are Argonne National Labs, and uh, we're and they're up there. You've got uh, Rob Ross, who was my Ph.D. student and was the, the writer of PVFS-1 and the chief architect of PVFS-2. Um, and... Also, Phil Carnes is up there. Phil was also one of my PhD students, and uh, he he went and worked with this uh, this data mining company for a number of years, and now he's working with Argon. But they, those guys have also they've really carried PVFS along through kind of the hard years of really kind of getting it supported. There's guys like Sam Lang and Robert Lathrum and uh, Neil Miller who, who wrote a lot of the co- code and. Um, there's just been a number of them, so so that's that's that group up there, and, and they're still doing right now. They're doing a lot of focusing on the blue gene um, stuff, and that's you know that's been great. Then um, at oh, well, we used to be at at Ohio Supercomputer Center. I don't think he still is. Is Pete Wyckoff? Pete um, was definitely involved in some of the networking aspects. He he did the initial Infiniband implementation for us. Um, and did a lot of work with how we actually put data on the wire and take it off again so that it would go across different architectures and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's also a couple other guys that were there. Uh, um, trying to remember his name. Troy Bayer, I think his name was. Um, trying to remember real quickly here. I think I have a list of some of these guys. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, Troy Bayer and Ananth uh, Devalu- Devalapali. Northwestern University, Alec Chowdhury and Avery Ching have done work with us. Uh, Ohio State University, DK Panda, um, Sandia National Labs, Lee Ward has been a huge help and supporter for us over the years. He, he really he really has been a, a major uh, player. Uh, Garth Gibson, I've already mentioned at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Scott Ashley from Miracom has helped us with the uh, Miracom drivers. Maury Villanueva has uh, was uh, at uh, Argonne for a while. Dave Matheny at Axiom. That's, I guess that's p- public knowledge. That's the company out in Ar- Arkansas. So yeah, there's been a great group of people as well as uh, as my students here, guys like uh, Brad Settlemeyer, um, and uh, some of the people that I'm working with now, like Boyd Wilson uh, and Elaine Quarles. Uh, so there's been quite a few people. We also have, oh, let's see, I, also, I almost forgot. There's some people over in Germany 
Um, we got some people over there too. I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Uh, Dean Hildebrand, maybe Peter Honeyman, a couple of these guys. So that's a that's a, a long laundry list of, of people and organizations there. How do you organize this? How do you keep all the cats running in the in the same direction? And you know, how do you how do you organize as a as a community? Well, uh, really, um, the organization has been that. Um, Argonne has been the center of it, really. Uh, so if anything that's going to actually go into the distribution has to go back to Argonne and get, you know, blessed there and, and go in. into and, and that's what we call the blue distribution uh, now is, is, is sort of the main line. Um, Axiom took their own copy, um, and they made whatever changes they wanted, and then and then we got together and agreed which ones would come back. You know, they offered pretty much every, all their changes back to us. Um, but a lot of the other ones in the smaller groups, we get together on on a regular basis. We meet at the major conferences. We there once or twice a year have uh, some meetings somewhere where everybody will try to come together, and we talk about our ideas and what we want to do. And then people go off and kind of work on stuff in a branch and. We later kind of evaluate, do we want to keep this or not? And, you know, frankly, there's been a number of pieces that people have done that we've kind of gone, nah, <laughs> nah, I don't think that's going in. But then there are, you know, other pieces <laughs> that, you know, that that have turned out really great. So, I mean, it kind of, it kind of goes both ways. So we're going to wrap up here in a little bit, but I have one last question. There's been a lot of articles floating around from HPC file system people that POSIX tends to tie their hands for performance, so you get POSIX-like, not quite POSIX compliant, or we need to just completely throw out POSIX. Could you give us your take on that? Sure. Um, there's a couple of different issues. Um, one of the issues initially was that you know the POSIX standard was indicated that all I/O would be an offset into the file and an extent. So I, I'm going to read a contiguous group of data from the file, and parallel applications in particular don't always do that. That's been largely dealt with POSIX. Uh, there are some POSIX extensions now that have these uh, uh, um, vector IO vex that you can set up and, and get around that. So that's not too big a deal. What the big thing that's really still kind of a sticking point is sequential consistency. And sequential consistency is something that's been an issue ever since people tried to start building um, parallel um, shared address space systems, which a file system is that. It's a shared address space uh, mechanism. And it comes down to uh, if two stations attempt to write to the same locations, um, it's, it, it, there are certain expectations that a user has as to what the result could be. Um, and sequential consistency says that you always get an acceptable result if you guarantee that um, all writes appear to have uh, completed in the same order to all people. And that's a, that's a, a, a fine goal, and it works nicely, but it can be very expensive to implement. Okay, the simplest way to implement it is to use locks. You have a, a lock somewhere, you acquire a lock, you then do your write, then you release the lock. If someone tries to do a lock to an overlapping region, they will not be able to acquire the lock until you're finished, and that guarantees that you write and then they write, and everybody sees it in the same order. Um, but managing locks like that is performance-wise expensive in the sense that it, it, it's it's costly. You know, takes time to to manage those things, um, and it's also um, it's also has a reliability issue because if a client acquires a lock and then dies, 
without releasing the lock, you, you have this problem that you have to somehow deal with because you've got this section of your file locked. And clients, unfortunately, do tend to, you know, abort unexpectedly, unlike servers that hopefully are, are a little more resilient. Um, and one of the things, for example, in, in PVFS is we, we do not use any locks in our implementation, okay, specifically so we do not have that, um, that reliability issue and we do not have the performance issue. And I think that's one of the reasons we've always had one of the fastest performing file systems going. But we, up until now, have never been able to, to do uh, sequential consistency completely right, and that's you know, some other file systems who've worked that out say, well, we can do it. And so the issue is that you don't necessarily have to have a fully sequentially consistent file system if your applications behave nicely. And behave nicely usually just means they don't try to write to the same place at the same time, which if you think about it, most applications don't want to do that anyway. Um, but there's always a few of them out there that do, <laughs> and they become sort of, sort of the issue. And so then you get into you know, and, and that's where all these come from. These almost POSIX, but not quite. It's like we're giving you something that looks just like POSIX. You can use it just like you're used to, but the behavior may be slightly different if you do something unusual. And um, but that's really where most of that comes from. Okay, we're almost out of time here. Let me ask uh, the, the question I ask almost all of our guests. What uh, source code versioning control do you guys use, and, and why? We use CVS. Um, why? Um, when wow. We, when we started <laughs> the project, <laughs> when we started the project, this project back in 2000, we kind of kicked around a couple of the alternatives, and and um, and. Uh, just didn't it's nothing really sort of struck us as being that that much better we were a small group at the time and then and now it becomes sort of a it's difficult to change something midstream so that's what we use so i think we've had one other rce guest who who still used cvs uh brock do you remember who that was i'm not remembering who that was off the top of uh no i i I don't. I'd, I'd have to go through and listen to the last 10 minutes of every show I found it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're really only the second uh, group here that we've talked to that still uses CVS. <laughs> now, power to you. Okay, so what's the uh, location where I can get some information in PVFS? Uh, what license is PVFS under? Um, and can I just download it or do I have to license it through somebody? Uh, you could go to www.pvfs.org and find out everything you want and get to the downloads. It is licensed under uh, the LGPL, and uh, you do not have to talk to anybody. You can just go there and download it. And there we have distributions, uh, tarballs that you can get, and you can get uh, anonymous access to the, to the CVS repository for uh, checkouts if you want to get newer bleeding edge stuff. Um, there's a subdirectory on under that, which is the slash orange subdirectory, and that's the new uh, distribution I was telling you about that we're working on here at Clemson, and um, probably going to be set, you know talking more about that at Supercomputing when we get there. Is, is sort of the, what we're calling Orange FS, which is just PVFS with some of these new features to it. That. Okay, thank you very much, Walt. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your time. Thanks. All right.